What's up guys, welcome back to The Educated Barfly. Today we're gonna to be making a cocktail called the 12 Mile Limit, which was created uh, during Prohibition uh, by a journalist and war correspondent named Tommy Millard. Um, the 12 Mile Limit refers to a rule during, during Prohibition called the Three Mile Limit. Now let, let me just tell you how this relates, the, the Three Mile Limit and the 12 Mile Limit, how that relates to one another. During Prohibition, the government decided that there was a three mile limit that, go, that went all the way out to ocean around a country. So the country plus three miles out into the ocean is where prohibition could be enforced. If somebody were to say, get into a boat and go four miles out into the ocean, then they would be outside of the regulations of prohibition. And so that's what a lot of people did. A lot of people got in their boats and either like people got big boats and went out to sea and had like traveling, like speakeasies on the ocean, like floating speakeasies. Uh, a lot of people went out to both consume alcohol legally and then also to sell alcohol to people legally. And there are a few characters around that time that were making very good money doing that. Um, so because of that, there was a conversation by the government to extend the limit to 12 miles. And this, this the journalist who, who found out about it, I guess, who, who made this, this cocktail in response to that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, let, let's just get into making the cocktail did they first. Ever do it? I don't think that they did. I think that there was just a conversation and they wanted to pass a law and it failed. But I, you know what? I don't know as of this taping, uh, I am going to research it. I like there's a taping. Well, it is kind of a taping, is it not? There's no tape involved, but yeah. Well, that's true. But I mean, it's just a saying. Thank you, Marius. Thanks for that. Appreciate you. Let's get into making the drink before I want to punch you. Because in the old days, we used to... Uh, My ice is melting. Tape. What? For you viewers at home that may not know this, we used to record the videotape. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, yes. I mean, I was going to say, don't you think that most people would know that? But maybe, I mean, maybe people, there, maybe there are some people who don't. Yes, we re used to record the videotape. I'm, I, that is so, that is so, uh, I don't know. That, it has nothing to do with what we're doing right now. It is, it's immaterial to what we're doing at the moment. All right, let's do it. Okay, half an ounce of lemon juice. Half an ounce of grenadine. Half an ounce of rye whiskey. Let's see, half an ounce of rye whiskey. I am so lucky that that did not break. So lucky, because this is a thin glass. Wow. Maybe I should drink less of the cocktails when I'm tasting it for everybody. Half an ounce of brandy. And if you don't have brandy, you can use VSOP cognac. And then one ounce of white rum. We are using Banks Five Island because I like it. And it has sort of a kind of back note funk to it that I really enjoy. We're gonna add our ice. Shake our cocktail. Nice shake, shake vigorously with ice. All right, here we go. And we're gonna double strain. Nice. Still good, that extra half ounce didn't matter that much. Yes. Yes! All right, cool. Just get it all out. Get every single ounce of cocktail out of the glass. All right, let's taste it. This is something I should be smiling about because this is gonna be delicious. Oh, yeah. Man, whoa. Okay, so you get the lime that provides a nice tartness, you know, balanced out by the grenadine. The grenadine provides that sort of savory pomegranate flavor and it does have sugar in it, but it also has pomegranate molasses in it. So it's very pomegranate flavored, not that sweet. It still allows the lime to be tart and sort of balances out with that nice, with that nice, um, sort of savory flavor. And then you've got the rye whiskey, the kind of spiciness of the rye whiskey and the, just that sort of like, I don't know how to describe it. It's that sort of like 
that sort of rye kind of tang to it. And I was, I was thinking that because we have brandy in here, which I can actually taste as well, kind of rounding out the sort of like savory sweetness that the rum would be lost, but you still have that back note funk on the back palate. And you know, I'm going to say something about this cocktail because I'm looking at it here. We're looking at it. Let's take a good look at it. It's nice and pink and kind of brownish red, right? You say that? Yes. And when we see this cocktail, we're going to say, oh, there's a lot of people who are going to look at it and they're going to say like, oh, this is just like another one of those like reddish brown classic cocktails. Mm, I don't know if I'm going to watch this video, but I want to tell you something, guys, that you guys should do yourself a favor and watch every single classic vi cocktail video that we post. And the reason why is because, you know, it's true that classic cocktails are both like brown or they're like yellow. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there just wasn't really a lot available at the time that a lot of these cocktails were created. You know, like technology only went so far in the 1800s. Old technology only went so far in the 1930s. And so like, and even though technology has, you know, obviously steadily progressed, you know, the thing is, is there wasn't a ton of variety in, uh, you know, what you could get in the ingredients that you used in the liquor that was available. You know, we take for granted the world that we live in, but you know, as a lot of people that are, that watch this channel in other countries know, like sometimes there is a scarcity in certain ingredients. Um, so the, the thing is, is that during those days in the older days of making cocktails, there was a lot of people who just sort of took one cocktail and tweaked it a little bit to make a new cocktail, you know, like everything built on everything else. That's why, like we said in the like six iconic cocktails video that we did, that like every cocktail comes out of six base kind of root cocktails. Um, but I will say that it is, whether you're a home bartender or whether you're like aspiring to be a bartender and you're just like a bar and you're a bar back now, or whether you are a bartender and you just don't know that much about the classics, or whether you know a lot about the classics, but you don't know a lot of obscure classics, it is imperative that you watch these videos if you want to kind of up your cocktail game. See. There is this analogy that I'm going to kind of try and it's hopefully this makes sense and uh, hopefully it's not too far out there for you. But I want to tell you guys how like Shakespeare and cocktails relate to one another, right? So when you are, it's like this, there are people who perform Shakespeare who are just masters at performing Shakespeare. They just, they can perform any Shakespearean play or sonnet and they are so masterful at it that you don't even need, you're not even inhibited by the poetry of the language that is a lot different than the way that we talk in normal life. And it's sort of in this kind of iambic pentameter. Um, and because they're so good at it, they're such good actors and they understand the text so well that when they perform it, it's just instantaneously, you know exactly what's happening. You don't even need to know all of the crazy uh, philosophical and historical references that are in Shakespearean text to just get what is going on. And it is obviously like a time, like timeless themes that Shakespeare was working with. Okay. And that said, um, there are times when a production, like let's say like a play, like a, or, or, or a, a production company that's creating a movie out of Shakespeare will try and gussy up, uh, Shakespeare by putting, different window dressing on it. So they say, oh, we're gonna do uh, all's well that ends well, but it's gonna be Rat Pack style. But the thing is, is that those usually suck because what happens is, is that the people who are creating those things think that they need to put window dressing on it because they're covering up for the fact that the people that are performing the Shakespeare oftentimes don't really understand, haven't really mastered the classic work. So, putting new window dressing on it's just gonna fall flat, right? And I would say the same thing about cocktails. Like any time you wanna break the rules, you have to first learn the rules. So if you're going to make a Rat Pack, you know, I don't know, all's well that ends well, or if you're gonna make a Baz Luhrmann, Romeo and Juliet, where you're like, all like the window dressing is like a futuristic post-apocalyptic Venice beach run by two rich families, right? It's not going to work unless the actors have mastered the classic text and understand the classic text. And then you put that on it and it enriches you. I mean, I think the Baz Luhrmann one was pretty good. I know that Marius, who's smiling behind the camera, thinks that the Baz Luhrmann one is pretty good too. And, you know, I mean, it, it broke Leo into like, I don't know, heartthrob-ness. Dumb. 
So, you know, obviously it worked, but uh, I would just say the same thing about classic cocktails. You master the classic cocktails first, and then you learn the rules, and then you stretch the rules. You create your own style, you break the rules, you do whatever you want, but learning the rules. So when you see the thumbnail of this, and I hopefully, hopefully, I mean, obviously if you're hearing me talk, you've clicked on this video and you've watched thus far, but I'm just hoping that when people see this, I'm just putting it out there into the universe, that when people see the thumbnail and they just see this kind of reddish cocktail that seems a little, you know, maybe not as interesting as something with, you know, palm fronds and, you know, banana leaves and, and pineapple chunks sticking out of it. When they see it and they just see it in its simplicity, they, they click on it and they say like, I'm going to try this drink because the complexity inside this glass is betrayed by the simplicity of the nature of the cocktail. I would just say that just because it's simple doesn't mean, I guess I, this is just a very long winded way of saying, don't judge a book by its cover. All right, cool. Well, we're going to garnish this cocktail with a little um, I want to float this little, I'm just going to take a, a lemon, half lemon wheel, and I just want to float it on top. And what's kind of great about this is that it is, this lemon is almost exactly half the glass. So when you see the top of it, you'll just see like half the glass with lemon on it. And it's a nice presentation. So there you have it, my friends, the 12 minute, the 12 mile limit. Definitely try this cocktail. Thank you for listening to me. If you've watched this far, thank you for watching this channel. I really appreciate it. Thank you to our Patreon subscribers who really, really go a long way for helping us do this show. And uh, thanks for watching. And I will see you guys next time. And if you like our channel, please hit like and subscribe and click the bell icon so you get notified. Uh, if you have subscribed, uh, you'll get notified every single time we release a cocktail, which is helpful to both you and us. And then on top of that, go and check out our Patreon. We've got some exclusive content there at patreon.com slash the educated barfly. All right, guys, enough talking. I will see you guys next time.